But if the uh, Fahrenheit temperature is uh, 200,000 Kelvin, the, the absolute temperature would be 370 degrees. Okay. Anyway, these temperatures that you are familiar with are all uh, quite positive, okay. more than uh, 200 uh, Kelvin. So, in other words, uh, even when you are you are in a very cold winter, the thermal motion of the atoms or molecules are still quite uh, energetic. So, I will talk about uh, the quantum behavior of atoms uh, when they are very, very cold, much colder than, than a few hundred uh, atoms. So, this is a, a very schematic uh, 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 illustration of the temperatures uh, that uh, you can encounter. So, the, this is zero degrees of Fahrenheit. Okay? It's uh, considered quite cold for human beings. Yeah? But it's still very, very warm from a physical point of view. So this is a logarithmic scale of the absolute temperature. So on the logarithmic scale, uh, things that differ by only a factor of two would uh, be quite close. Uh, so this is the temperature at which the water freezes, ice forms. At an atmospheric uh, pressure. And uh, you know that the surface of the sun is uh, much hotter. The surface of the sun is uh, at a temperature of about uh, 6,000 Kelvin. But on the larger scale, these two temperatures are not that different. Okay? And uh, the, I don't know if you have heard of the cosmological background radiation. It's the radiation left over from the Big Bang. And that temperature is a function of time. Initially, that temperature is a, was very high. It's a, about a few thousand Kelvin. And as the universe expands and cools, so temp that temperature gradually decreases. Today, the cosmic microwave uh, background temperature is about uh, three Kelvin. And this temperature is here. But I will talk about atoms whose temperatures are way below this temperature <laughs> here. At, uh, Something can be that can be uh, of the order of a nano Kelvin. A nano Kelvin is a temperature that is extremely close to absolute zero. It's uh, only 10 to the minus 9 power of Kelvin. Uh, by comparison, the room temperature in this room is about uh, 300. So, how do people get, uh, get to this kind of a temp low, very low temperature from uh, room temperature? The typical technique. Uh, they will use is to uh, do laser cooling. Okay. Uh, I will not, sorry, I won't uh, be able to uh, discuss the technical details on how laser cooling works, but uh, this is just uh, showing you that uh, it, it can be done. And uh, they could further use uh, the so called evaporative cooling to reduce temperature even further, and uh, uh, some loss of atoms. So basically, uh, they had uh, a vapor of atoms or even molecules in a vacuum chamber, confined in a small spatial region, and uh, it's a laser cool. So this vapor is actually much thinner than the air that we breathe. Okay? So uh, the air that we breathe has a density of uh, the order uh, kilogram per cubic meter. Uh, that's about uh, a thousand times smaller than the density of water, liquid water. For liquid water, the atom, the molecules, water molecules essentially are touching each other, so they are, they are close to each other. And uh, so when the, the air temperature is uh, smaller by a factor of uh, 1,000, so that means uh, the distance between the molecules in the air is about uh, 10 times the size of each molecule. It's of order the distance between the um, um, uh, nitrogen or oxygen uh, molecules is of the order uh, 10 angstroms. 10 angstroms or 10 to the minus 9th power meter. Uh, okay. But uh, the vapor that, uh, the cold atomic vapor that uh, people realize uh, in experiments are uh, typically a million times thinner than the air. It's much more dilute. So that the average interatomic distance can be something of order 10 to the minus 7th power meter, or even 10 to the minus 6th power. It's very dilute. So is a laser supposed to hit things? The answer is not necessarily. <laughs> okay. You shine laser on something that uh, 
And so a very strong laser, you can burn something. Right? But uh, the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for the development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser. One of the student, uh, one, one of the recipients, student Chu, was a former secretary of the alternative. Yes. So, what are cold atoms good for? Well, firstly, I think that they are good for satisfying our curiosity. But that's not the only reason, because the cold atom experiments are kind of expensive. So, to build a one lab, or I'm not a theorist. I'm not an experimentalist. Okay? I'm a theorist, but I. I talked with some experimentalists. I know that uh, typically you need to invest uh, about a million US dollars to build a uh, basic lab. So it's not, uh, not cheap. And uh, you need to spend uh, a few years, at least a few years, to build an internal structure of the and treat them as a bunch of problems. In fact, uh, one of the main reasons people are using uh, high energy accelerators to, to study the, uh, the nature of matter is that uh, they need to increase the energy of their particles so that they can reduce the wavelength. So that when the wavelength is shorter than the structure that you want to resolve, you will be able to resolve that structure. For example, if you want to see the internal structure of the proton, you need to accelerate the proton to an energy that uh, uh, I think should be much larger than the ideal level to see the internal structure of the proton. Otherwise, the protons are simply bounce off each other like the point. Okay, so now we have very low temperatures, therefore we treat the atom as a point particle. Now, since we have point particles, the quantum mechanics is somewhat simplified. So, now let's continue to the problem of two cold atoms, namely two points. Okay? Two points, they have a certain distance, r. And we can solve the Schrodinger equation to find uh, their motion. Not the motion of the particle, because the particle does not have a well-defined position or velocity. We can only define, uh, calculate the evolution of the wave function using the equation. If we have aluminium cold atoms, they will be described by a wave in three million dimensional space. Three million dimensional space. So our pri primitive minds cannot read it yet. So where are these quantum beasts? They are in many labs on Earth and maybe in satellites as well, because people have also carried out cold atom experiments in certain uh, landed satellites. So in this figure, I showed uh, an experimental group at MIT, where they, they have very complicated apparatus, and uh, the cold atomic vapor is inside a small vacuum chamber. In front of That's the, the uh, cold atomic vapor in So, so the bulk of the lab of the apparatus is uh, at room temperature. Only a very tiny vapor cloud in, in, shielded inside a vacuum chamber is at a very high temperature. Namely, they did not cool the whole apparatus to random chemicals. Uh, nobody could do that. So, how is this beast, quantum beast, held in empty space inside a vacuum chamber? Uh, remember that the atom also suffers from gravity. Even a single atom has a weight. It would fall with a, a 9.8 meter per second squared acceleration toward the ground if you put it in that. So how did people hold that prevent it from falling? One of the simple techniques is called the optical double trap. Namely, you shine a laser beam, and the laser beam can polarize the atom. As the, uh, the atom, uh, after being polarized, its energy is reduced a little. And the reduction of the energy of the atom is a proportional to the local intensity of this. And if you have a sharply focused laser beam, then the reduction of energy is the smallest at the center of this intensity maximum. So that you have a potential well, and the atom is confined to a potential well created by the laser beam. And it can, it can be strong enough to prevent the atom from falling. How does the one cold atom kick another one? So to answer this question, we have to use a Schrodinger equation. So here I wrote uh, the so-called stationary state of Schrodinger equation. So uh, the dynamic Schrodinger equation is h psi equal to i h bar part of psi bar t. But for the stationary state, we can replace that operator by energy e. Uh, 
In this equation, I have uh, on the left side in the Hamiltonian, I have two terms: kinetic energy of uh, one atom, kinetic energy of the other atom. Uh, in principle, I also should also include the interaction of potential energy between the two atoms. But the atoms are very tiny particles. The range of the interaction is very small. The range of characteristic range of the interaction between cold atoms is on the order uh, on the order of a nanometer. But I am talking about a cold atomic vapor in which the distance between the atoms is on the order of uh, a few hundred nanometers. Therefore, typically they are far from each other. So they are outside of the range of interaction. In classical mechanics, if two particles are outside the range of the interaction, they do not interact. But in quantum mechanics, it's different. Because of the spatial uncertainty of the atoms, even though most of the time the atoms are outside of the range of interaction, they may still be strongly interacting. That's kind of a paradoxical. To, answer, to understand this, we need to solve the Schrodinger equation. Outside of the range of interaction, uh, solve this equation at low energy, then you can show that uh, the dominant channel for the atoms to interact is when they have a zero orbital angular momentum. Okay. Because if they have a zero orbital angular momentum, the centrifugal barrier would prevent them from coming too close. So that, that the zero orbital angular momentum state is called S-wave state. In the S-wave state, the wave function is astronomic. It depends only on the distance between the two atoms. Namely, it's a function of a single value. And then you can reduce the Schrodinger equation. You can show that uh, if the energy is uh, very small, which is uh, true at, uh, in the ultra cold region, ultra cold means energy e close to zero, then you can get this simple uh, solution. It's a, the wave function is uh, of the form a linear combination of constant and one of r. Uh, by the way, this is also a solution to the Laplace equation in electrostatics. So the, the coefficient is a uh, uh, constant. Uh, this is called uh, the scattering. It's, the scattering is, uh, is a parameter that depends on the microscopic details of the interaction. But once you know the scattering length, you know how strongly the atoms interact. The, the larger the scattering length, the more strongly the atoms interact. Typically, the, atom, the scattering length uh, between the atoms is comparable to the range of the interaction, <coughs> namely of the order of a uh, nanometer. Uh, and also, if the scattering length is positive, the atoms are repulsive. And if A is negative, they are attractive. So, now, as I mentioned, uh, bosonic atoms have a tendency to collapse to the same quantum state uh, at the uh, outer cold energy. That's known as the boson einstein condensation. The boson einstein condensation was uh, uh, first, uh, for cold atoms, was first uh, created in 1995. And uh, it can be described by a so called nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Okay. So, all the atoms uh, fall into the same single particle state, described by a single. A one particle wave function, approximately. And this one particle wave function is uh, approximately described by this uh, nonlinear shooting region, where this V is uh, the potential uh, into the laser beam and gravity. Uh, and uh, this is the extra term is uh, due to the induction. So it's a nonlinear wave. And uh, this nonlinear wave, uh, you solve this equation, you can show that it uh, flows frictionlessly, just like the superfluid helium. So it's a superfluid, it has a remarkable properties. For example, it refuses to repeat. You can hold a superfluid in a, in, in a bucket. As you repeat in the bucket, the liquid inside the bucket does not repeat. Okay. There's no, no friction between the liquid and the, wall of the, and the wall of the container. But if you rotate it too fast, then the liquid will start to rotate, but it rotates in the so-called uh, quantized vortices. The vorticity are, uh, is quantized. Uh, it can only be multiples of uh, the Planck constant. It's a very different from normal liquid. Okay, uh, now let me return to the <coughs> question of the interaction. So, uh, cold atoms have interactions that can be tuned. That's uh, remarkable. So, let's imagine if we can change the strength of attraction between the proton and the electron. We can tune the size of this building. Fortunately, we cannot do the above magic. But we can indeed change the strength of interaction between neutral cold atoms. Uh, one of the main techniques is known as the magnetic refraction of resonance. 
What you do experimentally is to apply a uniform magnetic field to control the effect of the interaction spin. As you change the magnetic field strength, you change the scattering between the atoms. And there are certain points at which the scattering lengths may diverge. Okay, the scattering lengths may diverge at a particular magnetic field strength. That is known as the magnetic fashion resonance. Yeah, to understand this, uh, you need to uh, you need to uh, solve the quantum mechanical problem of two atoms. Won't have time to discuss that. Okay, so now let's imagine we have a three bosons interacting with a large scattering length. Uh, Efimov, who is a nuclear theorist, he was a nuclear theorist in the Soviet Union at the time he did the calculation. So he found that if you have a three bosons interacting with an infinitely large scattering length, which is possible, right? So according to this uh, plot, it's possible. The scattering is equal to infinity. Uh, then the three bosons have an infinite, have infinitely many exactly similar bound states. Okay, and the size of the bound state is much larger than the range of the interaction. Again, this is impossible in classical physics. In classical physics, you cannot imagine. A bound state of two particles uh, whose uh, size is greater than the range of the force. That's not possible. But it is possible in quantum physics. And these uh, bound states are no, now called uh, asymptotic uh, bound states. And uh, they have uh, <laughs> remarkable properties that are independent of the microscopic details of the interaction. So that different uh, patterns, such as lithium or Cesium, they have they can display similar phenomena in the ultra field. This is known as universality. I think the universality is also a, uni a very useful concept in high energy physics because of the fact that uh, the fundamental interactions of high energy particles have a very tiny interaction, maybe zero to our present knowledge. For identical bosons, uh, these bound states. Uh, have a size is that differ by a constant ratio, 22.7. It's a mathematical number that can be calculated by just some uh, very simple equation. The Efimov effect was experimentally detected in 2006 using cold iron experiments, even though it was first predicted by a nuclear theorist. So the phenomena it's uh, easier to realize in cold atoms because cold atoms have interaction strengths that are directed to them. But the uh, protons and neutrons uh, have interactions that are not so easy. Therefore, the effect is uh, easier to realize in cold atoms. So this uh, shows, uh, is a prime example showing the importance of a cross fertilization of different uh, branches of physics. The idea developed in one branch of physics may be carried over to another branch and. Uh, and, uh, and uh, help to, uh, to progress the, the research in another direction. I think it's also true for the general science. Progress in one branch of science may be used to, to, uh, to help to uh, grow the science in a very different area. So this effect was uh, experimentally detected in a very indirect way. It's uh, via the so-called three-atom loss rate. So this kind of a three-body bound stage will dramatically increase the rate at which the three, three, any three atoms in the vapor recombine to form a diatomic molecule and uh, escape the, uh, the, the laser trap. And you can measure the rate at which the, the atoms uh, escape from the trap as a function of the magnetic field, and you can di discover, discover certain features that uh, are consistent with the atomic It's a kind of indirect. Um, cold atoms may also be used to understand the relationship between superconductors and the superfluids. Superconductor is just a superfluid of charged particles, such as electron pairs. And superfluid is a matter in which particles flow without friction. It would be nice to have a superfluid that remains a superfluid above room temperature. But uh, this is not yet done here on Earth, uh, but it's Inside, uh, it's uh, realized in neutron stars yeah. in the universe. I think in the Milky Way, I don't know how many neutron stars it has, but uh, it should be very large. 
maybe I, uh, it's, we have about uh, 100 million black holes in the universe. The number of neutron stars could be similar. I, don't, I didn't check the number. A neutron star is a very compact object. It's a remnant of certain massive stars after their explosions. And its mass can be large, it's really typically larger than the sun. It's very heavy. But it's very tight, very dense. Its diameter is typically comparable to the size of the Manhattan Island. It's a denser matter of neutrons. Uh, but it's not only neutrons, there are also other stars. Uh, one cannot do experiments to directly see the physical properties of the, uh, the neutral matter in the neutron stars. However, one can use cold atoms to simulate certain aspects of neutron star physics. Uh, one of the experiments that people did uh, was uh, uh, using uh, fermionic atoms in two uh, internal quantum states. And uh, these, uh, by tuning their interaction strength, you can make them strongly interacting, then you can create a superfluid of, uh, of these. Uh, Fermionic atoms. So they behave very similarly to the neutral matter in neutron stars. So you can see this is a picture of what showing the quantized vortices in uh, that in the neutron in, in the uh, atomic vapor. And this is a signature of the superfluidity. So I did some work uh, concerning cold atomic fermi gases. I discovered some exact relations of all particles with large scatterings. They all involve the large KTL of the momentum distribution. But it's not the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Uh, do you know Maxwell Boltzmann distribution? Or the velocity of the molecules in the air? It's a, essentially, it's a Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution has a tail that falls off exponentially at large velocities. But uh, for the cold atoms with the large scattering, because of the interaction, the the velocity distribution does not fall off uh, like uh, exponential, but rather it falls off uh, like a power law. It falls off much more slowly at large velocities. It falls off like one of the k to the fourth power, where k is a proportional to the velocity of the uh, The coefficient is uh, now known as the contact density. This is the formula is uh, if k is large compared to the so called Fermi. The Fermi main number is the radius of the uh, of a sphere in the momentum space. For non-interacting fermions at a zero temperature, the velocity distribution becomes a sphere, sharply defined sphere. But for interacting uh, atoms, uh, the the velocity distribution is a sphere and it has this kind of thing. So I discovered some uh, exact relations. I won't have time to show them. Um, so why do we have this uh, uh, tail, one over k to the fourth power? It has to do with the fact that the wave function has this uh, one over r singularity, and uh, you make a Fourier transform, you get one over d squared, and then you take you use the Born's rule to take the square, you get the one over k to the fourth power. So there have been some recent experimental developments in cold atoms. Uh, more and more elements in the periodic table have been brought to outer cold regime, and uh, different atoms have very different. Uh, properties in the outer code, so they can be used for different purposes. And also, people have uh, produced uh, some outer code molecular vapors. And the outer code molecules have richer internal structures than uh, single atoms, and richer interaction patterns, and uh, more free body phenomena, and more many body phases, which could be used for many different interactions. Okay, so, uh, in summary, we have an optical matter that's uh, much thinner than the air that we breathe and uh, can be billions of times uh, colder than the human body than room temperature and behave quantum mechanically. And uh, as the experiments uh, progress, so they become more and more exotic and uh, complex. And one may wonder what this would lead to. Uh, could, we, could they lead to optical conscious beings? I don't know. But we can imagine. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, the quantum bodies, bodies, I first uh, need to define uh, the kind of, okay, so in a superfluid, from 
the first Pidansky equation, you can show that uh, the velocity is uh, uh, curl free. Okay. If you assume, if you assume if you um, if you assume that the wave function is non zero, then the velocity field is curl free. Maybe the curl of the velocity is uh, zero, almost everywhere, except uh, at the places where the wave function vanishes. Such that if you have a zero wave function along a certain line, then the line integral of the velocity around that line is quantized. Okay. Uh, it's a, uh, I think uh, you have this uh, formula. V equal to h bar over n um, nebula uh, phi, where phi is uh, the phase of the wave function. So from this, I think. Uh, you do the line integral of v dot dr, you get uh, 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 h times integral. h, 2h, 3h. So this is the vortex line. Along the vortex line, the wave function vanishes. And the line integral of the velocity around, around the vortex line is typically, for a single vortex line, the line integral of velocity uh, is h, is a black constant. Talked about how the <coughs> Borley uh, equation, where you decrease angular momentum, you get a larger uh, Borley wavelength. Does that mean that linear you, moment? Uh, linear linear linear. Moment, yeah. Does that mean that um, with the larger wavelength, you would be able to more likely uh, quantum tunnel over a larger distance or larger potential barrier? Uh, the quantum tunneling depends on the energy of the quantum. So if you have a barrier. Typically, the, the more energetic the particle is, the greater the tunneling will be. But even, at, uh, even when the wavelength is very small, oh, sorry, very large, the energy is very low, the particle may still pass through a value. Um, so, in mentioning um, well, anything quantum, um, from spin, what exactly is quantum? Quantum well, mechanical spin is uh, is the actually the nature of the spin. So um, let me first uh, define what a spin is. So uh, for those of you who have uh, taken my classical mechanics, uh, um, I, I I think you remember that uh, uh, I talked about uh, the angular momentum of any system of n particles with respect to the center mass. Okay, and that angular momentum of a system. Composition about its center of mass is called the spin of the system. So it uh, classically it uh, can it's a continuous. It can take any value, but it's continuous because classical mechanics is only an approximation. If you really go to a very low angular momentum, you find that uh, it's not actually continuous, but actually it's a quantized. It's a quantized uh, can only take these values. The projection of the uh, so, so S is the angular momentum of a, a composite system, or a single atom, or a single molecule, or electron, or whatever, uh, about the center mass. You take the product of S along any direction, let's say n is a unit value. This can only take discrete values. 0 plus minus h bar over 2, plus minus h bar, plus minus 3 h bar, plus 6, 3 over 3 over 2. So that's the quantum nature of angular momentum. Um, you mentioned that uh, basically a superconducting current is a superfluid of flowing electrons. Um, is, is there any mathematical sort of difference between those things, or do, can you, as far as the, the mechanics are concerned, can you consider the electrons in a superconducting current to just be a superfluid, um, since it is just a condensed state of bosons, or are there other things that you have to consider there, or is it just the same, I guess is what I'm asking. So, the superconductivity is a, in, in metals, uh, is a typically a consequence of the superfluidity of uh, not a single electron, but a uh, bound pairs of the electrons. Mm -hmm. Because a single electron is a fermion, they cannot condense to the same macroscopic wave function state. But, uh, 
when you have two electrons, which is an even number of fermions, that pair behave as a boson. And it can have some kind of microscopic weapon. And that is responsible for the for the supercritical. So one can show that if you increase the strength of the attraction between inside the pair to make the pair tighter and tighter, eventually this pair the pairs will look like point bosons. So there's a smooth crossover between superconductivity and uh, post Einstein condensation. And that has been demonstrated in using cold elements. In cold elements, sorry. Uh, we do have a very high temperature superfluids in neutron stars. Oh, I mean... Um. <laughs> um, I think uh, it, it should be possible. So the physicists at Harvard were able to create metallic hydrogen, and they think that if they can, uh, using high, ultra high pressures, and they think that if they can take those pressures off and it's still stable in metallic hydrogen, that it could conduct uh, superconductively, do you think that this this is possible? Because they're still doing that some now. Do you think this is a good candidate for a superconductor? So at a very high pressure, so it is possible to have a superfluid at high temperatures. But if you remove the pressure, I think uh, it will. So you don't think it would be stable? Um, I can I cannot I I, I don't know much about this uh, this direction. But uh, I think it's uh, healthy to have some doubt. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. the lecture, you mentioned that at equilibrium, the average kinetic temperature or kinetic energy of the particles we has what's been called time, something like that. What do you mean by equilibrium? I'm sorry? What do you mean? Um, equilibrium? Yes. Okay, so the equilibrium it means that, uh, suppose that uh, you, you have a a chunk of, uh, let's say, a glass of hot water and another glass of cold water. So if you mix them together, initially, they, the two parts have different temperatures. So that uh, the, the velocity distribution of the, uh, the, the molecules is very complicated. But uh, if you, you wait for enough time, such that uh, each molecule has encountered at least a, couple, a few uh, collisions, then the velocity distribution will become more equilibrium, so you have some kind of average, average out, so that you reach the same temperature, and all the molecules have the same temperature. So the velocity, the velocities of any number of particles will eventually come out of the So at the equilibrium, heavier molecules have a smaller average speed <coughs> because it's the average kinetic energy that's equal to three hundred. So that means that for heavier molecules in the same system, the uh, typical speed is smaller. What do you turn them in? Okay, so a lot of uh, technical stuff. One of the things I studied uh, is to uh, analyze the effect of a three body interaction. Three body interaction, such as uh, three coordinates. So there is uh, some kind of a concept analogous to the two-body scanning that I just uh, introduced. But that concept is uh, more complicated because the three-body problem cannot be solved analytically. So we have to use uh, some kind of approximate methods. For example, we can expand the wave function when the, when the distances are locked. But we cannot get an analytical solution. Another direction of my current research is uh, the many body physics, such as uh, the uh, many body physics of uh, cold atomic particles uh, uh, combined to one straight line. One straight line. Then, um, then the problem becomes integral. Uh, it has to do with the transport concept in which uh, if there were particles uh, combined along a line, suppose that the particles have equal mass and uh, they uh, collide elastically. Then according to the conservation of linear momentum and uh, the conservation of energy, then you see you can see that after they collide, they just exchange their velocities. And this fact is responsible for the integrability of the quantum strongly quantum quantum system. So that's 
so that the problem can be solved uh, more easily. But there are still some properties that are difficult to address, such as how to calculate the correlation. And the reason is that uh, the wave function is, even though it can be obtained analytically, the wave function is very complicated. It is uh, expressed as a sum of n factorial fields, and is the number of uh, volumes. So that, that means it's very complicated. So we still have to do the same approximation to understand the correlation. Even though we know the wave function. 